أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم صلى الله على محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم رضيت بالله رب وبالإسلام دينا وبمحمد صلى الله عليه وسلم رسولا ونبيا continuing on what the prophet عليه الصلاة والسلام is military legendary government legacy the era of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab the career of the military career of the Prophet والسلام, excuse me his military career is in a total of 30 videos on the same channel whilst uh, Abu Bakr Siddiq is a total of 50 videos here we are continuing on page number 500 uh, 2.1.1 appointment of judges judges were appointed directly by the Khalifa as when Umar bin Khattab appointed Shurai as the judge of Kufa or they were appointed by the governor acting on behalf of the Khalif, as when Amr ibn al-As, the governor of Egypt, appointed Uthman ibn Qais ibn Abi al-As as a judge in Egypt. The right to appoint judges belongs to the Khalif. If he wishes, he may appoint them himself, or if he wishes, he may delegate his governor to do that. The appointment of judges does not prevent the Khalif from examining some cases and passing judgment himself because judicial matters come under his authority and he is the one who delegates the role of judges to others or the role of judge to others. But he is primarily entitled to pass judgment and a judge only acquires that role when he is appointed by the Khalif himself or by his governor. It is permissible for the Khalif to dismiss a judge for any reason, such as if the judge is not longer or is no longer qualified and fit to pass judgment, or if it is proven that he has done something that does not befit the position of a judge. If there is no reason to dismiss him, then it is better not to do so, because a judge who has been appointed to serve the interests of the Muslim citizen should remain so long as their interests are being served. Omar bin Khattab dismissed some judges and appointed others, and when he dismissed Abu Maryam al-Hanafi, in whom he found some weakness. Or as when, that's what it means, not or when, excuse me. 2.2.2, judges' salary, Omar used to advise his governors to choose those who were fit to be judges. He would tell his governors to use those who were fit to be judges and to give them sufficient salaries. He wrote to Abu Ubaidah and Mu'ad saying, choose righteous men to appoint as judges and give them salaries. Dar al Umari mentions the salaries of some of the judges at the time of Umar, which were as follows Salman ibn Rabi'a al-Bahili Kufa. His salary was 500 dirhams each month. Shurah al-Qadi in Kufa or Shurayh ibn al-Qadi al-Kufa, uh, 100 dirhams each month. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud al-Hudafi in Kufa was also 100 dirhams each month and one quarter of a sheep each day. Uthman ibn Qais ibn Abi al-As in Egypt 200 dinars. Qais ibn Abi al-As al-Suhail also in Egypt had 200 dinars. So because you had Upper Egypt and you had Lower Egypt, judicial specialities. During the time of Khalifa Umar bin Khattab, judges would pass judgment on all kinds of cases, no matter what type they were, such as financial disputes, family matters, hudud, which are punishments, and qisas, and any other kinds of disputes. There is nothing to indicate that there was anything like what is known nowadays as judicial specialities. Apart from the reports that As-Sa'ib ibn Yazid ibn Uqtu Nimir was appointed and was told by Omar go and look after the cases that have to do with minor financial disputes, end quote. 
Judges dealt with cases having to do with civil rights and personal matters. As for hudud punishment and qisas, these were referred to the khalif and regional governors, who had to approve of the ruling approval of carrying out the death penalty was restricted to the khalifa alone. But governors had the right to approve of cases of qisas that did not involve the death penalty. There was no specific place set aside for judicial procedures. Rather, the judge passed judgment in homes and mosques, but it was more common for such procedures to take place in the mosque. Cases were not recorded because they were so few and were easily remembered. It was possible for a judge to detain the accused as a rebuck and so as to force him to restore people's rights. This was done by Omar, Uthman, and Ali radiallahu anhum during their khilaf. The state set up prisons in the city centers. Qasas punishments were carried out outside the masjids. 2.3 Qualities of the judge and what was required of him. Qualities of the judge from the life of Omar bin Khattab, the scholars have derived the most important qualities of the judge who is to be appointed. Knowledge of the rulings of Sharia because he is going to apply them in the cases he deals with and it is impossible for him to apply them if he does not know them. Piety, taqwa, Omar wrote to Mu'ad ibn Jabal in Abu Ubaid ibn Jarrah telling them, Look for some righteous men among you and appoint them as judges. Next was lack of interest in what people's people possesses. Omar said, no one can establish the commands of Allah except one who is not trying to appease people or show off and who has no materialistic ambition or materialistic ambition, excuse me. Intelligent, it is essential that a judge should be smart and intelligent one who notices uh, small trivial matters. It was narrated by a shabi that Ka'ib ibn Siwar was sitting with Omar when a woman came to him and said, O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen, I have never seen a man who is better than my husband. By Allah, Jalla Jalaluhu, he spends the night in prayer and he spends his days fasting and does not break his fast on a hot day. He prayed for forgiveness for her and praised her and said, You are saying something good about your husband. The woman felt shy, so she left. Kaab said, O oh, Amirul Mu'mineen, why didn't you help her to solve her problem with her husband? Omar said, What? Was she complaining about? He said she was complaining about a serious problem with her husband. He asked, is that so? He said, yes. He said, bring the woman back. He said to her, there is nothing wrong with speaking the truth. The man claims that you were complaining about. This man is saying that you were complaining about your husband and that he avoids your bed. She said, yes, I am a young woman and I want what any other woman wants. He sent for a husband who came to him. Then Omar said, Kaab pass judgment between them. He, Kaab said, the Khalif is more entitled to pass judgment between them. He said, I insist that you pass judgment between them. So you understand something about this situation that I did not understand. He said, I think that if there were three wives and she was the fourth wife, she would have one night in every four nights. So I ruled that he should keep three days and nights for himself during which he may pray and she should have one day and one night. Amr said, by Allah, your suggestion is more amazing than your understanding. Her hint, go, for you are the right judge of Basra. Very important uh, story. The next thing is strength of character. Omar said, I am going to dismiss Abu Maryam and appoint a man who, when the evil doers sees him he will be he will be uh, scared of so he dismissed him from the post of judge of Basra and appointed Kab ibn Sur instead next is that the judge should be wealthy and a good or he should be of wealthy and good lineage Omar wrote to some of his governors saying no one should be appointed as a judge except one who is well off or wealthy 
and of good lineage. The one who is well off will have no desire for people's wealth. And the one who is of good lineage will not be scared of people. Very important point. Okay, so now we get it. 2.3.2. Point two, what is required of the judge? There are some matters which are must stated the judge must pay attention to in order to establish justice. These include sincerity towards Allah Jalla Jalaluhu in one's actions. Omar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari saying, Passing correct judgment brings reward from Allah and will store up reward for you in the hereafter. Whoever has a sincere intention to establish the truth, even if it is against him, Allah will suffice him and protect him from the people. Whoever puts on a pretense that is not in his heart, Allah will shame him. Allah may he, Jalla Jalaluhu, does not accept any deed that people from people accept that which is sincere. Think of the reward of Allah in this world and in the hereafter. Next is precise understanding of the case. He should study in carefully before, or he should study it carefully before passing his rulings. It is not permissible to pass the ruling before the truth of the matter is clear. Omar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari saying, try to understand the case when it is referred to you. On one occasion, Abu Musa said, a judge should not pass judgment until the truth is a, or until the truth becomes clear to him as day and night. News of that which Amr ibn al-Khattab, and he said Abu Musa has spoken the truth. Ruling according to Islamic Sharia, whether the disputing parties are Muslim or not, it was narrated from Zaid ibn Aslam that a Jewish woman came to Amr ibn al-Khattab and said, my son has died. And the Jews are saying that I have no right to his estate. Omar called them and said, why don't you give her her rights? They said, we cannot find anything in our books that gives her any rights. Omar said, is that in the Torah? They said, no. In the Mishnah, he asked, what is the Mishnah? They said, a book that was written by scholars and wise men. Omar cursed them and said, go and give her her rights. Consulting others about any matter of which is not sure. Omar wrote to one of his judges saying, Consult those who fear Allah with regard to your religion. He wrote to Shurah saying, Shuraih, saying, If you want to consult with me, then do so, for I think that your consulting with me is better for you. Omar used to consult others so much so that Ashabi said, Whoever would like to have the most reliable judgment, let him adopt the judgment of Amir al-Mu'minin, for he used to consult others. Treating disputants equally, Omar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ashari saying, treat people equally when you address them, so that no noble man will hope that you will side with him unfairly, and no weak man will despair of your justice. He also wrote, and I quote, treat people as equal with regard to truth, both the one whom you know and the one whom you do not know. When Ubay ibn Kab made a claim against Omar with regard to a garden which Omar did not know about, they appointed Zaid ibn Thabit to judge between them. They went to him in his house, and when they entered, Omar said, We have come to you so that you may judge between us. Zaid moved them, let him sit in the best seat. And according to another report, Zaid brought out a cushion and gave it to him, saying, Here you are, O Amir al Mu'minin. Omar said, You have been unfair in your judgment at the outset. O Zaid, rather let me sit with my opponent. And they both sat in front of him, encouraging the weak so that he will not be afraid. So that something that the judge has to do is to encourage the weak, the accused, so that he will not be afraid and will dare. To speak up, Omar wrote to Muawiyah saying, Be kind to the one who is weak, so that he will be encouraged to speak. Dealing Next is dealing quickly with the case of a stranger or else, supporting him until the case is over. Omar wrote to Abu Ubaidah bin Jarrah radiallahu anhu saying, Pay extra attention to the stranger, for if he has to stay too long and be away from his family because of this case, he will forego his right and return to his family. 
Next is patience. Omar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari saying, the way of boredom, anger, anxiety, and feeling annoyed with people when passing judgment. If the judge notices any of these things, it is permissible for him to pass judgment until that has gone away. This is psychological state affect the judgment he passes. Page number 508, Umar radiallahu anhu wrote to Abu Musa al-Ashri saying, Do not pass judgment when you are angry. And it was narrated that Shurah said, Shurayh said, excuse me, Umar stipulated when he appointed me as a judge that I should not pass judgment when I was angry. Things that may lead to impatience and sometimes make a judge hasten inappropriately to pass judgment include hunger, thirst, and so on. Hence, Omar said the judge should not pass judgment until he has had enough to eat and drink. Now, the next one is avoiding everything that may influence the judge, such as bribes or trades, beyond being easygoing with him or his going to the marketplace or accepting gifts and bribes. bribes. Omar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ashari saying, Do not buy and sell, make investments, or accept bribes with regard to rulings. Shurah said, Omar stipulated when he appointed me as a judge that I should not buy and sell or accept bribes. Omar said, Beware of bribes and of ruling according to your whims and desires. Next is deciding on the basis of apparent evidence without probing into intentions. Omar addressed the people and said, We knew you when the Messenger of Allah was amongst us and the revelation would come down and tell us about you. Now we know you from what you say. So whoever appears to us to be good, we will assume that he is good and treat him well. Whoever appears us to be bad, we will assume that he is bad and hate him accordingly. And what is in your heart is between you and Allah Jalla Jalaluhu. Next is keenness to reconcile between dispute or disputing parties. Umar said, turn disputants away in hope that they will reconcile for settling the matter in court generates grudges between people. If they reach a settlement that is in accordance with the laws of Allah, let the judge approve it. And if their agreement is not in accordance with the ruling of Sharia, let the judge cancel it. Umar said it is permissible to make a deal between Muslims, except a deal that permits something that is forbidden or forbids something that is permissible. The judge should be keen to bring about reconciliation, especially between disputants in cases where it is not clear who is in the right. Omar wrote to Muawiyah saying, strive to work out agreements among people when it is not clear who is in the right or if they are related for settling issues in court generates grudges. Coming back to the truth, if a judge passes a ruling concerning some cases, then he changes his view on that issue afterwards. Studying it further, he cannot go back and change his ruling. It is also not permissible for a judge after him to overrule the judgment he passed. It was narrated that Salim ibn Abi al ajad said if Ali were to have undone a judgment that had been passed by Amr, he would have undone his judgment concerning the people of Najran. Ali had written down the treaty between the people of Najran and the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and their numbers increased at the time of Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab until he feared for the people concerning them then he then a disagreement arose between them and they came to Sayyidina Umar radiyallahu anhu and they asked him to rule between them compensation so he compensated them then they regretted it and something happened among them. So they came to him and asked him to let them off, but he refused to do so. When Ali became to Khalifa, they came to him and said, O oh, Amir al-Mu'mineen, you interceded for us and wrote a treaty with your right hand. Ali said, well to you, Omar was right in what he did. Omar refused to undo the first judgment that he had passed concerning them. And after Omar had died, Ali refused to undo the judgment that Umar had passed concerning them. Umar changed 
His opinion concerning many cases, such as the ruling concerning a grandfather, when there are brothers of the deceased in cases of inheritance, or full brothers sharing one third in the inheritance with with Arian brothers when there is nothing of the estate left for the full brothers. In other words, um, half brothers is what I believe. But there is no report that he went back and changed his first judgment. Rather, he applied his new had in subsequent cases. And his old ruling did not prevent him from following the truth when it became apparent to him. Amar wrote to Abu Musa al-Ash'ari radiallahu anhumah saying, if you pass a judgment today, then you change your opinion and are guided to the correct view that should not prevent you from adopting what is true. For truth is eternal and cannot be invalidated by anything. Returning to the truth is better than persisting in falsehood. On this basis, Umar ibn al-Khattab issues various rulings. Concerning the grandfather in cases of inheritance, as mentioned, he ruled that if... A wife dies and leaves behind a husband, mother, two half-brothers through her father and two half-brothers through her mother. Then the full brothers through the father and mother and half-brothers through the mother share one-third of the estate. A man said to him, you did not rule that they share the estate in such and such a year. Omar said that was the judgment that we passed then and this is the judgment that we have that we passed now, next, the accused is innocent until proven guilty. It was narrated that Abdullah ibn Amr said, I set out with a caravan, and when we came to Dhul al Marwa, a clock of mine was stolen, and one of those people was with us. My companion said to him, Also, oh, and so, give him back his cloth. He said, I did not take it. I went to Amr bin Khattab and told him about it. He asked, Who was there? I told him who they were, and I named the one who I thought did it, and I said I wanted to bring him in chains. Amar said, how could you bring him in chains without any proof? If there is a text there, is no room for ijtihad. Amar said, try to understand whatever cases are referred to you where there is no evidence from the Quran or Sunnah, then try to take analogy between the case that is before you and similar cases that are dealt with in the Qur'an and Sunnah. These are the most important matters to which the judge must adhere. Next section. 2.3.3 Judges themselves are subject to rulings on judges. Omar was the first one to submit to judges even when he was at the peak of his Khalif. He would express clear admiration if the judge in if that judge had passed righteously the judgment they managed to pass sincere judge uh, were the judgments even if the ruling went against him even if it went against Sayyidina Umar bin Khattab himself yes here are some here is one following example Omar wanted to buy a horse from a Bedouin he rode it to try it out, and the horse became lame. Omar said, take your horse. The man said, no. Omar said, then appoint a judge between me and you. The man said, shurah. So, shurayh. So, they referred the matter to shurayh, to judge. When he heard that, they had to say, he said, oh, when he heard what they had to say. He said, oh, Amir al-Mu'minin, take what you bought, or give back what you took. As you took it, Omar said, this is the way to pass judgment. And he sent him a judge and made Shuraih a judge of Kufa. 2.4. Source of judicial rulings during the era of the Khalif of Omar bin of the Khalifs period. Judges relied on the same source as the Messenger of Allah. And his judges had relied namely on the Quran, the Sunnah, and Ijtihad. But some new developments appeared during their era. The process of ijtihad and acting upon it was developed further with results in new procedures such as consultation and ijma consensus, rai opinion and qiyas analogy. There also appeared new sources which did not exist at the time of the Prophet, namely legal precedents which had been issued by the Sahaba during the reigns of different Khalifs. 
So the source of judicial rulings at the time of the righteously guided caliphs were the Quran, the Sunnah, Ijtihad, Ijma, Consensus, Qiyas, Analogy, and Legal Precedents. All of that was supported by Shura and Consultation. Concerning issues, cases, and rulings, there are many texts and reports